I'm standing before you here today on Wajak Nunga land to share with you some insights I gained from my sociological research. I learned that there's an urgent need for us as a society to legitimate, validate, and indeed dignify the economic, social, and emotional grievances of the bottom 15% of Australians. Those 15% of Australians who often occupy the most vulnerable social positions and who also identify themselves as being white. You probably heard my non-Anglo-sounding name. You can clearly see my superficial appearance. Have a look at the beard. It's to hide a double chin. I was born right in the middle of a raging civil war in Afghanistan. Now, you might be curious, why would someone like me care about this group? Indeed, why would someone like me use this opportunity to advocate for a group that he doesn't seem to belong to? But appearances are really deceiving. Yes, I may not look like this 15% demographic, but I have been their next door neighbor on Struggle Street. When we first came to Australia, for those first few years, we had it really, really tough. We pretty much lived hand to mouth on the welfare system. And, and I don't know how mum made ends meet. She was being retrained as a nurse, and my brother and I were just school kids. I remember the letterbox was such a source of dread for us, particularly for my mum, because that's how the bills came in. And there's one memory in particular that I always have whenever I think of this time. I'd just come back from school, and my big toe was poking out of my shoes. I'd split my shoes open playing Australian rules footy at lunchtime. Drenched in sweat and embarrassment of a 12-year-old, I ran towards mum, and without thinking, I demanded from her, Mum, buy me new school shoes. She started crying. And my little 12-year-old heart just broke. Those were the tears of a parent who thought she could not provide for her child. We were Aussie battlers in every sense of that word, except perhaps we're a little bit more tanned. And we would have lived on Struggle Street and would still be on there if it wasn't for luck, my luck, the luck of having an amazing set of teachers at my high school, teachers like Mr. Bell, who took me under their wing, mentored me, educated me in their own free time, and who also, importantly, gave me opportunities to give back to my school and to my community, and that's what changed everything. I went from failing to becoming the top student there to getting a fantastic education, and in 2013, I was recognized as the Young Australian of the Year for really passing on to other young people what Mr. Bell had given to me. And in all my travels as the Young Australian, all over Australia, and I met over 350,000 people, I particularly wanted to meet this 15% demographic. And contrary perhaps to your expectations, certainly contrary to media portrayals, these people were incredibly warm and gracious and generous towards me. They welcomed me into their home and into their communities. And when I told them about my struggles of being in a war zone, of being a refugee, and then of growing up in Australia on Struggle Street, they were incredibly compassionate. However, something changed when we spoke about minority groups in the abstract. Whether it was Aboriginals, asylum seekers, migrants, suddenly the tenor of the conversation would change. And these very same people would express anything from polite unease to vociferous contempt. And I remember thinking to myself, yes, I disagree with these views, but I know that you're very sensible, intelligent, compassionate people. You must have very good reasons for holding these views. And I genuinely wanted to understand and explore these views and the reasons behind these views. And so when I got my opportunity in my sociological research, I looked at the debates 
between those Australians who wanted asylum seekers to come in and give them a home and those who said no to asylum seekers and wanted them to be kicked out of Australian territory. So in these debates between pro-asylum seeker Australians and anti-asylum seeker Australians, my focus was not on what they were saying about asylum seekers, but what they were saying about themselves as Australians in debating about asylum seekers. And something fascinating emerged. Amongst the many patterns, one in particular struck me. Most of the pro-asylum seeker Australians expressed a life in Australia that was full of social hope. Most of the anti-asylum seeker Australians expressed a life in which there was a deficiency of social hope. Just to be clear, by the term hope and social hope, what I mean is the relationship we human beings have to our future and the extent to which that future is pregnant with the possibilities of life opportunities. And in our particular culture, those life opportunities, they mean things like getting a great job, having disposable income, being financially stable and independent. In other cultures, it takes on very different forms but the end result is always the same. These are all cultural logics in which human beings try to create meaningful, dignified, and worthwhile lives for themselves. And I say it's social hope because this is a type of hope that is socially distributed. It is distributed by society. Less on who you are as an individual and more in regards to the social location that you occupy. And it's precisely in this distribution that these anti-asylum seeker Australians felt that they had been shortchanged by the rest of society. Let me ground this in a tangible example. A hypothetical family that really are an amalgam of all the people I met as the young Australian of the year and all the people that form part of my data. And in the Smiths, you have George, and let's say Georgina, and their lovely, compassionate, wonderful, people and their pensioners. But for reasons they cannot explain themselves, they find themselves to be part of the one in three pensioners in Australia who are living under the poverty line. But what's even more distressing to them is the fact that the lives of their children have not worked out the way they thought it would work out. Their children, let's say Jenny and John, like their parents, went into traditional manufacturing jobs, low-skilled laboring jobs. And throughout the 80s, 90s and 2000s, Jenny and John watched as their jobs evaporated, either through outsourcing or automation. They moved on to the unemployment line. And yes, they could get a few part-time, precarious, short-term jobs here and there, but in effect, they had become unemployed, and very soon, they became part of the chronically unemployed. Now, let's really be clear here. Jenny and John didn't want society to give them financial stability and financial security. Their grievance is that society never extended them the opportunities in which they could work towards financial stability and financial security in their lives. That is the nature of their grievance. And for lack of those opportunities, they form part of the 2.5 million Australians who live under the poverty line. But of course, these are not just material <sighs> slides. These are also emotional pains. Just imagine what it would be like to look around your society, as perhaps Jenny and John do, and realize that they're no longer needed in a digitized, globalizing economy. What trauma does that do to a human being? They do not feel like they're excess laborers in our economy. They feel like they're just excess in our society. What Jenny and John are experiencing is known as social debt. It is the condition where your society affords you no reason for living on. And this pain and this trauma is compounded by two further injustices, at least in Jenny and John's eyes. Firstly, over the last 30 years, they found it harder and harder to be able to express their pain and their economic frustrations and yet still hold on to their dignity. And this was one of the most fascinating and unexpected findings of my own data. Whenever someone like Jenny and John said, hey, I'm really struggling, I'm hurting economically, can society please help me out? They were just pounced on savagely often by pro-asylum seeker Australians. They were called dole bludgers, welfare cheats, lazy, losers, and much nastier names, and often bogans. That was a common one. And so now, Jenny and John no longer, not only feel that their society does not care about them, 
but the very act of asking for this society to care for them further delegitimizes their voice, further marginalizes them. It seems that the worst thing you can be in Australia, short of committing a spate of crimes, is to be economically uncompetitive in the market and financially dependent on the rest of the society. And so, as a consequence, John and Jenny look around and they no longer feel that Australia belongs to them. They no longer feel that this social order is their social order, and it's certainly not for them or by them. And secondly, all the while they're being told there's nothing for you, they see these politicians and community groups, what Jenny and John would probably call do-gooders, generating social hope for minority groups, for indigenous Australians, for migrants, for refugees, for asylum seekers, and to Jenny and John's eyes, anyone but them. And it's not that at first Jenny and John hate these minority groups. No, they don't have hate in their heart. It's just that they keep asking, why are they getting something and my needs go invisible? And they just keep asking this and asking this and asking this, and it's either met with deaf ears or worse, met with scorn and derision. And so, John and Jenny, after a little while, become really bitter. They become really resentful. They start to look for other avenues through which they can express their frustrations because this is building. The pressure is just building and building and building, and these civic concerns get rearticulated through racialized idioms. It's a bit like the bottom of a pressure cooker blowing out because the valves, the release valves at the top, have been blocked for too long. And the moment these problems get articulated through the idiom of race, not only does this not address the underlying issue, but it actually creates secondary and tertiary problems that further marginalize people like Jenny and John and create issues for wider society. Everything from the unwelcoming trend that we're seeing to closed societies. I'm not here to propose any particular policy idea. I'm not here to propose any political solution. Rather, this is a plea to those Australians who have benefited over the last 30 years from the changes in our economy. It's really up to us, and it's really up to you to recognize and break down this empathy wall between you and this 15% of Australians who feel like they're on their hands and knees and on the floor, and they're fighting against these other vulnerable people for these tiny little crumbs of social hope. Can you imagine the indignity of that? What we can do is we can turn to them and say, yes, your economic wounds are real. Yes, your needs are legitimate and ought to be taken care of. And no, you do not need to fight on your knees for these crumbs of hope. Here, here's a seat for you at our national table. And once they sit down, then we can begin the more difficult conversation of how do we generate social hope in the lives of people who feel hopeless. Thank you.